Oh yeah, I mean, the, state the obvious. One of the hardest shots were definitely the opening sequence, the opening shot, the badass winner, as we called it. You know, it was um, just over three thousand frames, and um, and it, it, there was is quite a lot of little pieces that had to go into a planning that, executing that, and uh, in, in regards to shooting it and how to shoot it, um, and and then final execution in CG. Uh, along with editorial, the different beats that have to go along with it from beginning to end and making sure that the timing from the beginning works with everything that's that that concludes like a domino effect all the way to the end. Um, so and you could also uh, just interject of what was shot on set for something like that. Yeah, I was, I was going to pitch to the, that too, because that, that, that shot really took, you know, probably a year and a half. We, we, we started previsiting it first. Or, or storyboarding first, then pre visit it, and then working with the first AD coming up with a shooting order because we had we shot plates in Boston and Pittsburgh. We had uh, multiple, you know, 50 foot technocranes on trucks. We had a Russian arm, we had a custom built 360 background plate rig done for it. We had uh, live action car chases uh, through multiple streets in Boston um so there was a ton a ton of pieces that went into it um and then Nikos's team you know just putting all those together in a 3,000 frame shot most most shots are only you know maybe 50 frames or 75 frames so um when you start noodling on a 3,000 frame shot or if I give a note that changes something in the middle then the entire shot changes I mean just because you've got to work backwards and forwards into it so that's that those longer shots are, are challenging just just in the nature of the length and that one particularly is has a lot of assets in it yeah we threw in the whole kitchen sink on that one yeah i actually really love that shot for the live action to cg takeovers it's very seamless because i i, I wanted if you wanted to mention what you know compositing um, challenges that particular sequence had because that's something I felt was really seamless. Well, I, I think before you even get into uh, compositing, uh, uh, I think the the trick or the best thing to prepare yourself for something like this is making sure that all your assets are there. You know, um, mm -hmm. making sure that all the assets that the, the assets that you think that you don't need are the ones that you need. You know, it's like uh, the sidewalks, the the buildings, the windows, the the, the 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 asphalt, everything underneath is you just need to be prepared. So when when the plate's not working, you need to stitch it together and it's just not syncing up, then then you have to rely on CG to do that. So making sure that you're prepping for all those assets, you know, so when when it doesn't work, you have it there ready to go and you can pull that trigger. And um, and most likely we always pull that trigger on a shot like that, you know. Well, one thing I forgot was the uh, the the slow motion um, 360 um, and in the middle was was a, we did a made a, a Dan Sudik's special effects team made a custom built um, car rotator and because it's sometimes this doesn't make sense but because it's in slow motion everything has to move very very fast so we shot it um, with a custom built car mover and then the camera was put on a um basically a, a robot uh, a auto industry robot um you know and i think it went 16 70 miles an hour um so it did all that so, i mean so it um yeah, that was a, a a technical challenge of the shoot too yeah you got to be careful with the robot like that because you know if, if it, you know you have actors inside that vehicle and if that that robot's going really fast and if it makes one weird mistake you know it could t chop somebody's head off especially on that convertible that they were sitting in um so mm -hmm. it, it, you know that it was it was a bit tricky to be around that you know you just have to be respected you know because it, it was very powerful uh, mm -hmm. but it was pretty cool it really worked out pretty well we we definitely had like a, a uh we had the compositing was definitely a a key issue on that we've had our senior compositors on that one one to mention is Corey anthony he actually really drove that whole thing home uh, more or less single-handedly, and that's just, just led the team of compers to actually really um, uh, execute that whole thing from beginning to end.
Well, I mean, we, we had the job of destroying Free City in a couple different ways. Uh, one where, you know, the street squeeze, uh, where we were down into the city blocks. So it was very high detail. And then we had the glitching, which was these larger, uh, more wider scale shots. You know, so there was tons of assets and buildings and uh, you name it, uh, props that we need to build. Um, and, you know, it all started with the layout department, like the layout department had to take all these assets and kind of get it into place so that we can start simulating and do the effects. So, you know, it, it was a challenge in that respects because, you know, every, it, the work we did and the type of work shows how important every department is, you know, from start to finish in order to get something that complicated to all come together. Um, so that was uh, you know, that's always uh, a good feeling when you're you're utilizing the whole facility <laughs> in that way. <laughs> but there, there was one shot. It was um, that kind of it was kind of a one off. It was the, the kiss. And that was where, um, you know, Molotov girl kisses Ryan uh, guy to get his memory back because she you know, he's been rebooted. And it, the whole story of the AI, the fact that he's aware and how just a, a simple kiss like sparked all the memories and brought the, you know, uh, everything back. Um, you know, visually it was, had to be something that worked with the story. Um, and then Sean, like, you know, I was like, I don't know about, the, you know, but it worked in the movie with the sound and everything. So, I mean, as a one-off shot, it, you know, it, really helped the the story i think you know um and you know it was different than what we were doing uh on a larger scale uh you know in some of the other sequences so mm. you know i'm i'm a, a romantic at heart what can i tell you it was a visual <laughs> arousal for sure <laughs> i love it Dang, drop in dude now dares to be original catchphrase Catchphrase? Well, I mean, I don't think one up yet. Although catchphrase, as a catchphrase, is a pretty cool catchphrase. Free guy. He's just like you, but way better. Ready PG-13, only in theaters. Um, Swin, I wanted to make sure to also mention some of the great face replacement work done in the film, with especially the dude and um, guy fight. Um, what I'm interested in asking you about is considerations for how to shoot that. Obviously, it was some great... Um, Lola work and shooting in the egg and doing that kind of approach to face replacement. But when you're thinking about how to do that stuff, are you thinking, oh, it could be motion control, it could be full CG, it could be more a 2D approach? Tell me about the early considerations for something like that. So I, I worked on uh, Night Museum 3 with Sean Levy and um, in that movie, there's a, a character called Law, which is Larry's, which is, um, I'm blanking on Ben that. Stiller. Ben Stiller, yeah. so that's Ben against Ben. And we shot that motion control. And um, Sean early on was like, Swen, figure out a different way to do it. Cause it's, it's um, the motion control is very, very, very time consuming, especially when your actor has to go through uh, makeup changes, which means you've got to, you know, shoot the A and B side on different days, and, and it, it is quite tedious. Um, however, um, making talking face replacements is terrifying. Um, so uh, early on, I took uh, Ryan's. I didn't tell anyone that I was doing this because I didn't want to. I wanted to make sure it worked first. Um, uh, I took Ryan's stunt double named Dan Stevens, and we found Aaron Reed the the bodybuilder actor um, uh, over to Lola in pre-production and shot uh, some sample plates and we put Dan Stevens face on Aaron Reed's face as a proof of, proof of concept um, and everyone was very excited because it really really sped up shooting and made it you know super fun um, and so uh, it was desired to not it was a we're trying to save time on our shoot days mm. Sean, Sean's very very quick um and so we would have uh Aaron on set and Ryan on set and Ryan would do 
a quick pass of Aaron's part just to sort of give him guidance on on you know kind of being Ryan-esque and then we um then we just shoot the shot with you know Ryan against Aaron and then I do a additional reference pass with Ryan in there um just for making sure the lighting was getting done well and then in the egg we had a ton of fun um and we ended up adding a bunch of dialogue after we shot principal so we like changed the movie in the egg which um uh, it's a tribute to sean and, and ryan and ryan's ability to riff too so um there's lots of uh, uh you know dialogue in there that was never scripted originally and we shot it mm -hmm. Uh, co completely at, in in post. That was actually right when COVID hit. We we're literally going to shoot the egg, and we couldn't fly anywhere because of COVID. So we ended up shooting shooting the egg stuff quite late, like uh, eight months later. Yeah, I mean, just just on on the whole film. That's one reason I love it. There's that kind of work. There's environments DD's doing. There's Sims that Scanline is taking control of. Obviously, there's other studios involved as well. It was like the whole gamut, wasn't it? <laughs> That's what I really like, guys, about it. Yeah, no, there's, there's something for everyone in there. And and it was super fun to work on because unlike other movies, there's just no rules, meaning, you know, you'd be looking at a shot going in post. I mean, I'd sat around with, with Sean and Dean, the editor, and just making jokes and looking at shots and going maybe this shot needs a hot air balloon on fire or dropping money or you know let's put a pterodactyl in there or or some you know there's just any anything goes which is uh, a pr privilege and rare and super fun yeah I, 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 can, I can pretty much say it was the kitchen sink you yeah. know we, we we had a lot of freedom and uh, it kind of filtered down to the artists like literally we we're like go for it you know come up with something and it just kept kept getting better and better you would think you know whoa 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 slow down it's getting you know too many sprinkles not enough nuts no you know just add more ice cream yeah <laughs> brilliant we had a, right, lot, guys, a lot of strawberry ice cream on this too <laughs> You know, <laughs> on top of all those visual effects, we have the gameplay to kind of like mm. put that in a different perspective too. But on top of everything is also the graphics too, and which yeah. was really a, uh, talking about eye candy and saturation and more sprinkles. Uh, it just that was the icing on the cake for sure. Yeah.